até a casa da família Monteiro, em Goa, Candelim. Ao longo de 450 anos de presença portuguesa na Índia, em Goa, deixámos, obviamente, muitas marcas. Nos últimos anos, no entanto, essas marcas têm-se perdido desde a língua à religião. Hoje, já há apenas uma, uma geração acima dos 60 fala o português e o cristianismo, ou melhor, o catolicismo, apenas um 30% da população pratica o cristianismo. Portanto, perguntamos que marcas é que ainda se encontram. Talvez aquela que no dia a dia, nos mídias, nos jornais, nas conversas, conseguimos ainda ouvir, é o palavrão Portuguese House. E quisemos saber porquê chamar a isto uma casa portuguesa. Quais são as semelhanças, quais são os traços que se encontram aqui, apesar deste, deste alpendre, a que os goeses chamam balcão, enfim, uh, ter algumas semelhanças com alguma, algum estilo de arquitetura portuguesa, ficámos curiosos de saber o que é isso da arquitetura portuguesa e porquê. Vamos ao longo deste programa tentar desvendar esse mistério. Uh, a meu ver, a arquitetura goesa não tem nada a ver com a arquitetura de Portugal, apesar de chamada, são chamadas casas portuguesas porque eu estive em Portugal, passei de norte a sul, não vi nada parecido. E a arquitetura de cá de Goa é o que eu gosto. São certos elementos como o balcão e sempre um adro, que é para ventilação e para luz. E depois há um certo, um certo espírito nessas casas. Além disso, a própria largura da parede, porque então as alturas são um bocado altas e precisava de paredes mais largas. Isso mesmo dá uma certa, uma certa beleza à casa. Eu nunca tive assim a grande atração pela arquitetura, mas uma coisa foi que eu queria ser o que se chama em inglês self employed Mas, em todo caso, acabei o curso. E depois voltei, comecei a exercer, depois comecei a ver que não era assim muito do meu agrado. De maneira que eu, pouco a pouco, comecei a deixar. E lá por 2001, meti-me na música. Por acaso, é uma coisa que, até quando eu era estudante, queria, sempre gostei de música e queria um dia ser músico. E pouco a pouco, meus pais não, não, não queriam, porque em Goa a música está associada com álcool. Né? E, depois da morte da minha mãe, meu pai faleceu muito antes. Meti-me na música. De hoje em dia, vou modificar o meu modo de vida. Naquele instante que você partiu, destruiu o nosso amor. Agora não vou mais chorar, cansei de esperar, de esperar, enfim. E pra começar, eu só vou gostar de quem gosta de mim Só vou gostar de quem gosta de mim Eu só vou gostar de quem gosta de mim Well, it's, it's amusing in, in a way, you know, but it's understandable. You see, like every kind of, you know, in a place like India where we are, the culture is so different, when something is, is unusual, it's, it's at a premium. So I see, the, I, I see the need for people to name all their villas with Portuguese names or to try and tell people that they're selling them a foreign uh, symbol, you know, and uh, it gives it a certain value. And uh, strangely enough, I, I've, though I'm going, I never lived in Goa. And uh, the first time I visited Goa when I was about 21, and I came here and I was amazed at the architecture. It was really exciting. It was, and. Uh, About 15 years ago, I, or 12 years ago, I went to Portugal for the first time. And I understood uh, that we are some distant cousins of, of what was there in Portugal. And, there's, and we took, we borrowed certain elements and we turned it around completely to create something completely different. And uh, these are not Portuguese houses for sure. But for a lot of people, it's useful. You know, like a, it's a useful thing to sell a different culture or a different architecture and uh, I find it amusing. 
you mentioned elements. Yes. What are those elements specifically? I mean, you're talking about the windows. I mean, give me, give me visual uh, data. See, yeah, you see what happens is, uh, like it's, let's take the case of windows. You know, we were a society, uh, once we had become Catholic, we were a society which was, was trying to establish a new architecture of what uh, uh, a new life for ourselves. From, from, uh, and by virtue of conversion, we were also very experimental. We were like, we were starting a new life. It's like we were being transplanted in a new, in a new society. And we were very adventurous. So we, people from Goa, I, I presume, traveled to Europe. You saw what the churches had brought, the architecture, and you, I don't think you only went to Lisbon. I think people from Goa traveled all over. And we started taking the elements of windows, of the geometry of, of uh, the uh, domestic architecture of Europe and changing it and putting it here and being very innocent about the approach, uh, maybe using much more than than a studied approach or a very academic approach. We were being exuberant. And it was from doors to windows to columns to uh, decoration. I think it's the most exciting period uh, of Goan society when we were building these houses. Even though they're very old, uh, they're able to adapt to a new lifestyle very easily. And that's, that's what's unique and very different about you know, these Portuguese houses versus like modern architecture, which is fairly specific about, you know, uh, the lifestyle and therefore in the sequence of spaces. And, and I think the sense of our nation which these houses have is really what, what makes them charming. It's the, it's the little details, the little touches, and the variations of those uh, elements, little elements, whether it's railing or the, the windows, the grills or the eaves boards. On the ceilings, of course, you've got the, the little the frescoes and uh, it really adds a great deal of uh, you know, charm to the house. It also helps scale down the room because if you have a room with very tall ceilings and you have this motor above, it starts bringing it down to, to eye level almost yeah, because the doors are very tall and the frescoes almost bring the ceiling and you know, make it more interesting. So it's, it's a slow sequence as your eye moves up, you know, past, past the door. Each one mm, in every perfect. different house, you know, varies and, and that's what... Uh, what you mean keeps, the, uh, the dynamics of the space? Uh, the architecture is very interesting and alive. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. There's a very curious architectural element or detail which I call the dog houses. And I can see them practically on top of every roof. Oh, the water tank. <laughs> can you explain to me what are those dog houses? Yeah. I mean, in the days before hydropneumatic systems came in, pressure systems for water, of course, you needed to keep the water tank you know, at the highest position. And there's always one, one messy architectural element that you had to deal with because the water tank had to be at least four meters above your shower head. And every architect had this you know, enormous problem of how do you blend this tall tower you know, into the structure. So they really treated it as a tower. They tried to slap on architectural elements into it the, at times successfully, at times you know, with disastrous results. Well, uh, I, I don't know. I, think, I, I don't look at it as a sort of Goan phenomenon or anything like that. But you see, once uh, running water came into the place, and uh, running water is never continuous in Goa, so the tank became important. You had to have a tank which was high enough for the pressure to come. And uh, the tank uh, became a sort of uh, obstruction, or it was something which everybody looked at, not only in Goa, but the whole of India. In Goa, I don't see it as being more prominent. And if you, I mean, you could write a book you can do a visual book on the water tanks of India where s there are water tanks which look like there's a Mercedes Benz uh, up on the roof which is actually a water tank or it's, uh, it's a bus or you know it's all sorts of shapes no, not in Goa but in other places so the water tank is some kind of necessity and I, I don't think it's, it's been so uh, overdone in Goa as in Punjab in Punjab, it's like, um, it's gone crazy over there. I think uh, one is to approach the architecture with a bit of fun, you know, so you play around with it a little, you, you uh, respond to the idiosyncrasies of the client, you know, you, each, each 
client that you have, each person wants to build a house, has his own little requirements, his own little um, lifestyle that you respond to. So whether it's you responding to an open style of living or the little, the way they'd like their, uh, they sequence their, a day in their life you know, is, is what you really look at and, uh, and your architecture you know, captures their personalities uh, in the house. Uh, at the same time, you know, rooting the architecture, the house needs to say that where, where it is, it's from Goa. You know, as an architect, to create an imagery, you have to start from uh, uh, a root. And for me, local material is the root. Local material is one root, the other root is the site. You know, the site pot potential, like, like this house took its shape from the hill. You see, there's a big hole there. So it got into the hill and it took its shape from there. So, like this house actually, for me, was an experiment in all the material which was available in Goa. Like there's laterite, it's interesting, there's granite, there's basalt and there's river pebbles. It was an experimental time, I just started working. But after some time you realize that laterite is Goan material and uh, it's, uh, it's very simple to build in laterite. Yeah, the latter, it's, it's actually unique to this, the Konkan coastal areas. Uh, you know, it's a sort of sedimentary rock. And uh, it looks porous because it has little pittings in it. But actually, it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it keeps the elements out effectively. Um, so if you can use it in exposed state, and having a lot of ferrous content to it, actually, it hardens with time. So as you expose the laterite to the elements, it gets harder, which is quite a unique you know, feature to it. Yeah. Traditionally, of course, it's been plastered over, but it, it's very pretty on its own. And so long as you protect it with a decent overhang, you don't allow the water to be directly in it and you know, collect moss, it's, it looks uh, the same from the time you've you know, laid it down to you know, 50 years later, because it just maybe darkens with time as it gets you know, harder. And it's only when water runs over it directly, then it can pick up a moss. Uh, so even in compound walls, when you use laterite, it gets a patina of time, you know, a little mossy look and all, which can look quite pretty also. But otherwise, it's, it's a very sensible stone because you can, you can virtually build your house by just excavating the back of your property and you know, excavate the stones in most areas, yeah. which is what we've done for a few projects, in fact. Yeah. So it's, it's in a way sensitive, ecological, provided, of course, you don't chew out too much. So if you're, if you're digging for your foundations or a little pool or something, the same rocks can be used. Yeah. And you can use it either in a amorphous form, that, or you can use it in a cut form, which is they cut into these blocks, which they can almost like large bricks. The nice thing is you can mold it very easily also. You can chisel it, you can create molding, so you can use little corbels or little linings on windows and doors. Yeah. So it's very malleable and it gives a lot of expression to the architecture. As architecture is one of the most enduring and visible forms of any bygone era, or any period in civilization, especially in certain areas where a fair amount of development work was carried out by the rulers of that period, one gets to understand or distinctly see a particular way, a particular style of building, either characterized by certain decorative elements or the materials used which probably are the locally available materials. You're just talking about materials which is for me one of the uh, richness of Goa is that in Goa you have this uh, ready-made bricks so you just go to the rock and you take them out, the, the famous laterite. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on how important uh, that privilege of having just there on your ground uh, the, 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 the major tool of, of, of the old periods architecture and, and how, how that influenced really the, the price, the style of the constructions in Goa? See, if one is to analyze the history of Goa, not of very long ago, but for the previous, say, seven to eight hundred years, besides a few Hindu temples which were built, and some of them are still 
existing like the Tamri Surla temple, the Mahadev temple at Tamri Surla, and a few vernacular architectural patterns. The rest of the formal architecture that one sees today or that has survived the time is generally the buildings constructed, the public buildings constructed during the Portuguese occupation of Goa, which was for almost about 450 years. During that time, they have built a lot of churches and coming to your relevant point, most of these churches were built with the laterite stone and you will generally see a large quarry somewhere in the vicinity of each church for proximity of obtaining a material. Esta cor, castanho escuro, ferroso, é a cor de Goa. Goa é rica em minério de ferro e os montes de Goa, é dos montes de Goa que se extrai a latrite e o ferro. E, portanto, a paisagem é dominada por este castanho, forrado de uma vegetação luxuriante verde e interrompida por uma profusão de igrejas brancas que dão uma, uma, uma personalidade muito curiosa à Goa. No entanto, essa, essa paisagem, essa, essa cor, mudou. Hoje, já não é o castanho, o verde e o branco, são os amarelos, os azuis e os vermelhos berrantes. A nova arquitetura de Goa está a mudar a paisagem. Vamos ver o que se passa. Vamos saber porquê. As pessoas gostam de usar estereotipos na arquitetura. Então, você... Eu quero dizer, você tem uma arquitetura moderna que toma os colores. Okay, like we had three main colors here. It was like a, a, a indigo, there was ochre, there was red, all from three natural materials. And uh, they were very bright and gay, and the Goan houses used them. Now, as a stereotype, modern architecture, when you say modern, I mean commercial, a modern commercial architecture, has taken these colors, and, and taken these colors and changed them, of course, but they have the same bright uh, or look about them, and they call them Portuguese, influenced by the Portuguese. Uh, the same way that they take arches, and uh, the, you put many arches of a certain shape, and then you say, okay, this is uh, modern architecture, a modern take of what was historic. And to me, it's the kind of architecture of uh, memory, which sort of trivializes uh, what was there in the past, and uh, it doesn't interest me so much. See, I, I'm actually I'm I'm a modern architect, you know, but but a regionalist, you know, in the sense that I work within, uh, you know, I, I believe that I t I should be taking my cues from from the region, you know, and uh, region in every way, from the material which is available on the site to the, what the site looks like to material available. Um, in the area, there's no point in getting material from from miles away when something is available there. So if I if I construct a, a, a house on a river, I would be using those kind of pebbles. I, I've in fact constructed one recently, taking the the pebbles from the river and making the whole house with it. You know, so my modernism also takes this into account. You know, and I like shapes, I like forms, and uh, you see. We have not grown up in the same way the European architect has grown up. You know, we were not, I mean, modernism for us, we didn't, you know, like, Europe became modern. There was a point between after the war where there was a new life, but we didn't do, we didn't experience this kind of thing. Our thing came, I think it's just, it, it's come actually very seriously in the last um, 15 years through cable TV. You know, this kind of imagery of buildings, you know, which you see buildings in Europe and America, and we now replicate these buildings. But we didn't, I don't think we, this, see, modern architecture came with a whole modern industrial uh, processes of making buildings, the way they're made, of factory-made things. We didn't become industrial like you all became industrial. We are just becoming industrial now. You see, 
post liberation that's almost about more than 45 years ago we had very few architects who were practicing in goa and at that point in time there was not much of construction work that was carried out in goa besides the government buildings but gradually with the force of development and economy improving today goa is witnessing a rapid growth in terms of construction the government policies like the prominent or the one very noticeable one is the tourism where government almost about 20 25 years ago has made tourism as the thrust industry for goa so you had immediately facilities in the public sector as well as the private sector to match the growth of this industry it was a bit slow at the start but the last 10 years have witnessed a very rapid growth in the in the uh, in the tourism industry so you had a number of hotels residential compounds and even houses coming up in urban as well as semi urban and the bulk of this work was witnessed along the coastal belt of goa partimos para esta aventura à procura do que seria uma casa portuguesa que elementos definem esse estilo ficamos a perceber que era um estilo de que os goeses se orgulham muito que tem muito paladar português mas levanta-se uma nova questão e as igrejas será que as igrejas também apresentam o mesmo tipo de fusões o mesmo tipo de cruzamentos de estilos vamos tentar descobrir uh, na arte não há nada de puro sempre há elementos que se uh, entrecruzaram Portugal próprio recebeu quanto elemento da Renascença. A Renascença começou na Itália e daí veio a Portugal. Em Portugal teve já se vê os elementos do Manuelino. O Manuelino pôs a sua, digamos, a estampa portuguesa com elementos de, dos descobrimentos. Portanto, seria um estilo tipicamente português. Mas no mais é, o, é a Renascença, é o estilo da Renascença, o estilo do Rococó o estilo do maneirismo e do barroco e rococó, tudo isso é como as igrejas uh, portuguesas, italianas, alemãs, mas já se vê com elementos da, da, da arquitetura portuguesa. Isso. Agora, quando isso vê a Goa, uh, eu acho que elementos da arquitetura portuguesa prevaleceram cá em Goa. E no decorrer do tempo foi absorvendo elementos da arquitetura, digamos, ou da elementos decorativos locais. E aqui era da arte hindu, indiana hindu. Isso está faz parte muito é, é, é parte da da arquitetura e da coisa de Goa. E portanto, e portanto os elementos, as igrejas que há lá e coisa que nós temos aqui espalhados por toda a Goa. Nós temos lá elementos com características cristãs, os ícones cristãos, mas ao mesmo tempo há tanto outro elemento, principalmente elemento decorativo indiano, hindu, e coisa. E portanto, isso faz faz parte da da cultura da Goa. A igreja da Tivi, por exemplo, é um outro espécime deste deste sincretismo na arquitetura e nos elementos decorativos. E assim, cada igreja da Bardeja e Salsete seria, eu diria, o um nunca acabar de, 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 dos exemplares deste sincretismo ou deste simbiose na arte indiana e arte ocidental. Se se vai a um templo hindu, o Sanctum Sanctorum é um lugar muito pequeno, muito mais baixo, é uma espécie de quase um lugar uh, escondido. 
onde uh, uh, o comum da gente, o público, não tem, uh, não tem acesso para isso. Só os sacerdotes e, digamos, as pessoas sagradas do templo podem ir lá. O, o, o público não pode ir lá, portanto é sempre um lugar pequeno. E o templo, as igrejas em Goa began to follow a similar reduced sanctuary, a smaller sanctuary in front of a larger nave. And in the external manifestation, elements in the finials, the small little decorative elements that would come at the corners of the church, you began to see pots, flower bulbs, lotus, and various other Indian flowers, fruits, these elements began to be seen in the finials. É a igreja da Divar, é a igreja de Santo Estevão, é a igreja de Santana de Talaulim, é a igreja de, do Espírito Santo, é a igreja de São Francisco de Assis. Estas cinco igrejas são o exemplo, digamos, do barroco indiano. O barroco ocidental em que se integraram estes elementos uh, da arte indiana hindu. Vamos para o interior. O púlpito da igreja, por exemplo, era um lugar principal no passado. Como é que o púlpito é sustentado? Em muitos casos, são as sereias que aparecem. E em tantos casos, aparecem com grandes seios. E elas próprias sustentam os seus seios para lhe dar um sentido, digamos, da vitalidade. Em outros casos aparecem os evangelistas e coisa, mas estes elementos decorativos próprios, que eu diria da, entre a arte eh, ocidental e a arte indiana, é, está, consiste nestas sereias bonitas. Em certos casos, diria eu, o, certa gente pudica, talvez, achou talvez que faria as sensibilidades e foram lá, por sua conta e risco, foram lá cortando os seios destas sereias. Mas há outras igrejas em que aparece perfeitamente uh, uh, esta sereia em toda a sua beleza. Na igreja de, de São Jerónimo, na, em Mopsá, veremos lá no interior, há algumas figuras madonhas, caras humanas madonhas, são elementos da mitologia hindu. Em Mopsá existe o templo de Hanuman, e quando se vai lá ao templo de Hanuman, vê-se a cara de Hanuman, assim, um, uma cara masculina, máscula, madonha, hein? vê lá, e, portanto, era o demônio e coisa. E essa mesma figura, cara, assim, máscula e madonha, aparece lá no interior da igreja de Mopsá. The other area where there was a cross influence of the Western and Indian style of uh, architecture, are the piazza crosses, the crosses which stand in the church square, and the lamp tower, Deep Stamba, which stands in the Hindu temple courtyard. The, the Deep Stamba in temples like the Mahalsa temple, Mangeshi temple, have got this octagonal uh, towers, and, it, and they have floors, they have small little floors, and they go up to seven stories, eight stories, and each of those floors has got niches marked on all sides, and those niches are almost baroque in appearance. They have the cornice, they have the arch, they have the pilasters, very baroque, very neo-Roman. And the, the cross which stands in the church courtyard, those crosses, If you look at the structure, there is a structure at the base and the cross mounted at the apex. If you take the cross away, many of these uh, structures look like little miniature Hindu temples. They follow, some of them follow the Nagara Indian temple uh, profile. And many of them have the decoration and styling very, very similar to Indian temples. So this is one area, the deep stump and the piazza cross, which these two structures influenced each other very much. And that is where we see the east and the west coming together. The Portuguese style, or rather the pan, the, the European style, 
of, uh, the, of the neo Roman period is very strong. It can be seen in all the old churches up to 1950, 1950 or so, after which the more modern styles came into being. But by and large, it is these old structures, these old neo Roman churches of European motif and Indian influence, these are our wealth, these are the these are the churches to which people have got a bonding and which the whole world identifies as uh, the religious, the Christian religious architecture of Goa. Os goeses são um povo que se orgulha da sua identidade, da sua cultura, do seu património, algum do qual ainda construído no tempo em que Portugal por cá passou. Tentámos ao longo deste episódio percorrer esses caminhos, mostrar-vos esses palácios, esses templos, essas igrejas. Mas há muito mais para descobrir. Gostávamos de fazer isso convosco, talvez, num próximo episódio. Até daqui a 15 dias.